Hi, my spooky friends, and how are you doing today? I hope you're having a fantastic day. Welcome to, and welcome back to the Crocheted Caution Tape, where we talk about all things dark history, true crime, mysteries, and anything spooky. I'm Erica, and today we are going back in time. We are going to be discussing Rasputin. We are, I am still working on sewing the caution tape together. We do have crocheted on there and the C for the caution tape. We're just gonna keep on trucking, keep on going through it. All right. So let's go back. Go back in time. So Grigory Rasputin was born January twenty second, eighteen sixty nine as um Grigory Novi. Alright. We're just gonna go ahead and preface this. I may mispronounce a lot of things. I do not speak Russian and I apologize. I'm going to do my best though. Alright. So he was born in um Pokrovich near um Tyumen, Siberia, in the Russian Empire, to, um, he was a Serbian pe peasant and mystic. Gregory Rasputin was, he was a character man. Like, I knew he was kind of crazy and he had, but... So Gregory, he did attend school as a child, but he uh, remained illiterate. Uh, he had a he had a res reputation of being lis licentious, which of course I. Did not know what that word meant, not gonna lie. I had to look it up. So according to Miriam Webster Dictionary, it is lacking legal or moral restraints, especially disregarding um, schmuxual restraints, marked by disregard for strict rules of correctness. Well, that's one heck of a start, man. Like, okay. Um, with this reputation is how he um, earned, he earned his, his surname of Rasputin, uh, which in Russian means the, the uh, watched one. At 18 years old, Rasputin had um, decided to have a religious conversion. Like he went to a monastery in Verkocher Ver in there he was introduced to the Plastic Clasty Set, also known as Flagellants. Yeah. Uh, this sect was founded, discovered, created, what have you, in the 17th century. 
and it diverged from the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, Kleisty sect, they rejected formal priesthood. Okay, yeah. They uh, rejected holy books and uh, the veneration of saints. Kind of sounds like. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, they believed that the possibility of direct communication with the Holy Spirit and its incarnation in living individuals. Rituals were known as uh, Redenia, and there were a lot of singing and chanting and dancing. Uh, and with all of that they were rumored that they had also during their dancing they were dancing in the nude and there were a lot of uh, orgies and self-flagellants flagellations to experience the divine grace and repentance. Is that her child's head? Okay. As if that wasn't crazy enough. Yeah, Rasputin. He he did find that the Kleisty sect was more to how he felt. But it wasn't exactly what he felt. So he decided that he was going to do a little twisty twisty and some manipulation to it for it to suit his own needs. Hmm. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Just going to say that. Not going to any further into that one um so what were Rasputin's beliefs that he twisted Kleisty sect into he felt that the one that was closest to God one was closest to God when feeling holy passionlessness passionlessness well how do you reach passionlessness I'll tell you the best way to reach it was through the schmexual exhaustion that comes after prolonged debauchery he's off being like hey this is how we should do it this you're only close to god unless you do this now as one could probably tell the rasputin did not become a monk he would be known throughout his time as the mad monk of even though he technically was not him. Love my GCs. Okay. So, Rasputin returned to Pro Pocro. Pokrovskoy. Pokrovskoy. At 19. So he was only at the monastery for a year. 
Now, whenever he returned, he got married. Somebody that was all for um, debauchery and everything, and kind of, he got married. So, his wife was um, Proskova Theodorovna Dubrovna. I'm going to have that typed out somewhere. No, I cannot say that. Why did I pick a story where I can't say the words in it? Alright. Uh, he had... They had four children together. Now, whilst Rasputin was in town, you know, he made, pe made a lot of people nervous, alright? He was, when he'd be talking to people on the streets, his hands fluttered incessantly. Um, there were even times when, like, okay, I talk with my hands, so I really have no room to talk with. But, apparently it was crazier than people just talking with their hands. His, also, his torso would randomly seize for a moment or two, and like they, his body would seize in particularly whenever he was very passionate and trying to emphasize a point more. in the 18, late 1800s, like, yeah, that's gonna make people very nervous. Like, he made a lot of people nervous. Like, he was very odd. He was odd. Yeah. He would boast about him only taking a bath once a year. It was a... Well, it was a very smelly man. I don't see how anybody could be around him when he didn't clean himself. So... With his, uh... Oh, what's the word? The debauchery that he believed in, of course, married life did not suit poor Rice Pete. And he ended up leaving the home. Now he did not, he, he did remain married and he would come back every year around the uh, time to start planting the farms and getting the harvest ready. He would return home during this time to help the family out. But he still, like most of the year, he had left. And he was like, he, he wanted to find more of his religion and being a mystic. So he traveled to Mount Anthos in Greece, uh, Jerusalem, these religious cities, and he lived off of just the donations that people would give him off the streets. What a, what a way, what a way to live one's life. I mean, if he was happy, who am I to judge, but... Russ Putin would soon claim to be a Star Rex, which is a self self proclaimed holy man. Remember, he never became a monk. So he was just going around telling people, hey, I'm the holy man. I am a mystic. I have healing powers. 
Let's go. Believe me. And it worked. It worked. Uh, he said he was like, he was able to heal the sick and see the future. It's crazy. Like, not crazy, but crazy? I don't know. I do believe in psychics. But this just seems weird. In 1903, Rasputin traveled to St. Petersburg in Russia, and he was welcomed, open-armed, warmly welcomed, by uh, Theophon, who was the inspector of the Religious Academy of St. Petersburg, and... Hermogen, who was a bishop in Saratov. They were like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, let's go. Um, now, during this time, there was early 1900s Russia, there was a lot going on. There. And while the peasants were suffering, the nobility and the court were like entertaining themselves with um, diving into mysticism and the occult. And Rasputin just fit right in. He was like, yeah, let's go. Let's do this. I'm a mystic, yo. Let's get this party hopping. Many people would describe Rasputin as a filthy, unhemped, smelly wanderer with brilliant eyes. They said that his eyes were very bright blue, piercing blue eyes. But he was he was filthy. He did. He he boasted about taking only one bath a year. Whew. Really going to take one bath a year. Like find a, find another way to keep yourself clean. But hey, again, who am I to judge? In 1905, sorry you guys, I'm not sure if I've been in frame this whole time, but I've been sewing if I haven't been. Right. 1905 was when Rasputin was introduced to the royal family. This would be Tsar Nicholas II and Tsarina Alexandra. Now they they had called for Rasputin because you know, he was self-proclaimed healing man, holy man, that he can heal the sick and whatnot. And one of the Tsar's kids, Alexei, had um, hemophilia and would have several bleeding episodes and he wouldn't be able to get the bleeding to stop and they call, called in Rasputin to be like, hey, can, can you help us? Can you, can you help us? Of course he was like, hey, yeah, let's do this. And before we get into that, let's all talk a little bit about where the hemophilia came from. Alright. Back in the day, royal families tended to marry within themselves. Okay. Alexandra was 
related to Queen Victoria. Yes, the I am not amused. Um, wonderful queen of England and several of her family members would be diagnosed with hemophilia due to the um, marrying within the family. And so Alexandra was a direct granddaughter and goodness, why will that not go through? Okay. Okay. We got it. We got it to go. Alright. Also, like I said, royal families like to keep things within the family. So would it be surprising that Nicholas II and Alexandra were third cousins? Not surprised. Not a surprising bit of information there. So with all of that, um, the hemophilia ran in the family. So, let's go back. Rasputin went to the palace and was like, yeah, you know, can heal him. Let's do this. And he did. Well, he didn't heal it, but he helped him. He helped the bleeding stop and most believe that Rasputin was able to do this through um, his hypnotic powers. Yeah. And they, they were able, he, they, Rasputin was able to uh, calm Alexei's suffering. And as he was leaving, as Rasputin was leaving the palace, he made a little comment on his way out the door. He told the Tsar and the Tsarina that um, the destinies of the child and the dynasty were irrevocably linked to him as in to Rasputin. Now saying this after healing their son pretty much guaranteed Rasputin a uh, lasting spot on the court. Anytime there was something wrong with the family, especially Alexei, Rasputin was immediately called. Gave him very much, so much power. Um, it gave him influence over the pol- He wasn't really political, but, you know, he had a lot of influence with the imperial family and, um, with the affairs of the state, the family saw him as a um, humble, holy peasant. They didn't see anything wrong with him. They kept him around. Mm. Now, outside of the court was different. The people saw the true Rasputin. They saw that he had licious, like licious habits. Um, he would tell people that physical contact with his own person had a purifying and healing effect to get people to touch him so he could 
proceed with his debauchery, with his promiscuousness. Now, word of this conduct did make it to the house, to the palace, but with how much Rasputin was helping Alexei, Nicholas II was like, mm, nah, nah, I don't believe you, you were making this. He refused to believe anything other than Rasputin being this great holy man with healing powers. Keep hearing the door. And anytime he had Iote, my baby. Due to Nicholas II's refusal in seeing this side of Rasputin, anybody that accused him of these uh, salacious acts, they were removed from the region. Like, they were sent off, exiled away. Or if they were in a um, position of any kind of influence or power, their positions were immediately revoked. He had this much faith in Rasputin. Now this was, he, he kept doing this until about 1911. Now, in 1911, Ras Rasputin's um, reputation had gotten to the Prime Minister of uh, Stolipin. And when this happened, you know, Nicholas wasn't able to do anything. Like, okay, you know, I may be the czar, but this is the prime minister, and I can't really go against him if you're saying that, that he is disruptive and immoral, then I need to get rid of him. So, out went Rasputin. He was exiled. What did that last? Within a very few short months, Rasputin returned to St. Petersburg because Tsarina Alexandra called him back because Alexei had gotten worse and she was like, Look, Rasputin was the one that was able to help him. I'm calling him back. I don't care what you say. He's going to help my son. Of course, with it having to do with his son and what his wife wanted, he, uh, he, Tsar Nicholas was like, yeah, he can stay. Bring him back. He'll stay. Keep the wife happy. Uh, Heal my son. You know. Don't really care about his reputation, basically. Because he thought that keeping Rasputin away was doing more harm than it was doing good. Um, he felt like he was endangering his family by not having this mystic on hand. So he's like, yep, yeah, you come back, you stay. And from that moment on, he went back to ignoring all allegations against Rasputin. 
sorry, when sewing, I tend to bring it up closer. Alright, 1915. This was the height of Rasputin's um, power in the Russian court. Uh, World War One had started, and Nicholas took charge of his army. He went to the battles. He went to the front lines with his troops. He was there supporting them, fighting alongside of them. Great. This left Alexandra in charge of the... Um, internal affairs of Russia. Now, of course, she absolutely adored Rasputin and took his advice wholeheartedly. Like, hey, you should do this. Hey, you should do that. Okay, let's go do that. Okay. Okay. Um, he became her personal advisor. So he went from healer and mystic to personal advisor of the Tsarina. His influence was over um, the appointment of church officials and the selection of cabinet ministers. That was a lot of power. Okay. Um, most of the people that he put into these roles were incompetent opportunists. Um, he also sometimes intervened in uh, military matters, which he definitely shouldn't have done. Like, that was all Tsar Nicholas, not that recipe. And this often had bad effects within the country. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Now, like I mentioned, Rasputin didn't really care for politics. He didn't belong to a particular political party or anything, but he was very much against anybody anybody any party that um, pretty much talked bad about the royal family or himself like he was very protective of the royal family I mean they'd given him so much he worked with side by side with them for so long like yeah he was very protective and just was all about the autocracy. May have messed up on that knot. Oh, jeez. Definitely did. So, Rasputin is most known for having so many death attempts on his life and him surviving. Like, everybody was like, you, you know, you can't kill Rasputin. Rasputin is physically immortal. So let's talk about his assassination attempts due to his closeness to the royal family. Alright, so the first assassination attempt was in 1914. 
um, Alexandra had called him to the palace to uh, discuss the threat of war from Austria. Hmm. Um, so she called Rasputin and normally he would be like right there let's go I'm there Cesarina has called for me I need to get there like now but this time on his way he came across an old woman beggar so Rasputin stopped and he was like digging into his pockets to get um Uh, he's reaching into his pockets to get money to give her. Now, as he was doing this, she wasn't a beggar. She was, um, she was an ex-follower of the monk, um, Eliodor. And they didn't really get along with Rasputin, they had different beliefs, and I'm guessing that they blamed Rasputin for something, because as he was reaching into his pocket to get the money, she pulled out a dagger and proceeded to use said dagger on Rasputin. And he struck him like right, right above the navel. Um, Rasputin did not go into shock. He did not fall down. He actually ran off to a, a little wooden patch that was near where all this was going on. And he got a stick. <laughs> he's right above the navel. He's got an injury and he's running off to the woods to grab a stick and come back. To beat the woman with a stick. No. Uh, after this, um, Leodor, yeah, he went into hiding. He was like, mm. Mm -mm. he should be dead, and he's not. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. And. Rasputin took the next few weeks to recover from his wound. But then he was good. He was fine. Now. We're going to discuss his next few attempts. Because they are all intermingled together. So we're going to say that these are attempts two through five. Alright. World War One. Uh, their the Romanovs believed that they would win the war. They were like, "Yep, we're gonna win. There's no other alternative to this." If there was any talk of surrender, um, it was seen as a treachery. They were charged with treason and automatic grounds for banishment. Well, they, they like to banish people. Now, this is where Rasputin actually disagreed. He wanted peace. He believed that peace was the only way to protect the royal family, to save the monarchy, monarchy, He believed that this was the peace was the only way to save the monarchy and avoid a civil civil war. Wow, what is wrong with me today? Okay. Um. Now this didn't go over so well with uh, Prince Felix Yusupov, who was the Tsar's cousin. He knew that Rasputin wanted to do this. He knew that this is how he believed. 
what he believed in. And he didn't like it. He's the royal family's, like, most trusted advisor, and he wants to talk peace? When it's calls for banishment? He, he, he didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. Not to mention he absolutely despised Rasputin. He hated him so much. Oh. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so. He somehow found out about a secret meeting that Rasputin was holding. And. Barged in. It was a secret meeting that we. That Rasputin was having to discuss his beliefs in the matter. And he said that Rasputin was surrounded by seven shady looking men. Four of them were of a distinctly Jewish type, and the other three were fair and curiously alike in appearance, assumed to be German agents they looked like a group of conspirators now i'm one that i have never understood why people dislike people of other cultures it makes no sense to me he was like yeah conspirators let's go um there were talks that they think that Rasputin was actually trying to um, talk a peace treaty with the Germans. Yusupov did not like this at all. He did it. He's like, no, we're going to win this war. No talks of peace. He's, no. Um, so after this, he had planned... Rasputin's death. He invited Rasputin to his palace. Uh, with Vladimir Mitrovovich Mitrovonovich Pershkovich. He was a member of the Duma, which is the uh, was the germ was the German, the Russian assembly with advisory and legislative functions okay and the grand duke dmitry pavlovich who was also the czar's cousin they planned together this whole elaborate scheme to get rid of rasputin they invited him to come to uh, yusupov's home on uh, December 29th, 1916. Okay. And... Uh, they poisoned. They poisoned Rasputin. All of uh, the tea cakes and the wine that... Uh, Rasputin had consumed was laced with cyanide. But that did not kill Rasputin. It didn't affect him at all. We don't know why, but it had zero effect on Rasputin. And he was just like, -de -da -de -da, not knowing that anything had happened. So getting frustrated with this, with the poison not working and the plan going down, like Yusupov, then shot Rasputin. Hi, Boggy. And again, so that's two, three, four on the third. Uh, Rasputin fell, but he was able to get back up didn't kill him um Rasputin was actually able to run away he ran into the courtyard of that palace 
and that is where Parish Kovech then shot Rasputin again. So all of this one night, Rasputin has had been poisoned, been shot not once, but twice. So we're all in one, two, three, four, four attempts of murder. Attempts on his life at this point. Um, but the second gunshot also did not kill Rasputin. Like, what is going on? This guy's still not dying. But it had weak weakened him to where um, the three Yusupov, uh, Par Par Pavlovich, and um, per Perishkovich, they hide Rasputin up bound his legs, bound his arms, and this is December, the end of December, in Russia. It took him to ne Neva River that was frozen over. They found a hole in the ice and threw the bound Rasputin into the water. And that is where he is said to, he has finally passed is when he was thrown into the river. Now there are some that say that the gunshots actually did kill him and that he was just thrown into the river as a precaution. It's not really known for sure. Whatever reason the three didn't think that he was dead by the gunshots. So bound him up, threw him in a frozen river to join him. Uh, Yus Yusupov stated this devil who was dying of poison who had a bullet in his heart must have been raised from the dead by the powers of evil. There was something appalling and monstrous in his diabolical refusal to die. Uh, the three thought that with Rasputin gone, that would leave uh, the Tsar to be more open to the advice of the nobility and the Duma. Like I said, the royal family was all about Rasputin and took his advice over anybody else. Um, but that didn't work. Uh, after Rasputin's death, the Tsar did not change his views, did not change what he felt, what he believed. He continued on the way he was. He didn't change his path. And um, since he didn't, and so many things. But this all led to the... Uh, start of the Russian Revolution in March of 2020. 20, oh my god. March of 1917. Jesus. Okay. The Bolsheviks saw Rasputin as a, as a corruption at the heart of the imperial rule. Okay. And his murder was an attempt by the nobility to stay in power at the expense of the working class. Sounds about right. Now, I wonder what could have happened. Like, press Putin's meeting that Yusuf, Yusupov, Yusupov barged in on. It. If press Putin was trying to strike up a peace treaty with the Germans, what, what would have happened? Like, if he had not been killed and was on the verge of striking up this peace treaty, what would have happened? 
if he had succeeded. I mean, there possibly would have been no Russian Revolution, which would have uh, prevented the Romanov family from being ass assassinated in on July 17th. 1918 maybe the the czar would have remained alive and you know uh possibly even preventing at least part of world war ii like there wouldn't have been no stalin if the peace treaty had succeeded and it's just like so what what like what do you guys think? what do you think would have happened if Rasputin would have been successful in his peace treaty talks if that was indeed what he was doing. It's so much. It's so weird. Like, what? Ah. Alright. We are so close to being finished with our caution tape, so it will more than likely be done by, um the next video but let's see where we're at so far so we've got bro shade caution ha so all we gotta do is put the p and the e on here and our crochet caution tape will finally be finished yeah, yeah, okay. Right. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I am still a little, um, working on, I have so many ideas, you guys, like so many ideas. I got so much yarn from Joanne yesterday, and I'm just like, I have so many ideas that I want to do, I want to make, I'm trying, still trying to come up with like a good variety, good selection so I can start up a new shop, and what do you guys think? Like, would you all be interested if I opened up a shop? Uh, what kind of things would you be interested in? Would you give me ideas? Give me ideas. Um... That is all I have for today. Uh, be good to yourself. Be kind to others. And I will be seeing you guys later.